All right, so we're continuing our Bible study. We started a couple weeks ago in uh, 1 John. So here we are in chapter 3. And just I'm going to just call to your attention, your recollection, that um, as we do these Bible studies, especially in this book, that this is a continuation from chapters 1 and chapters 2. It's, it's all part of one big theme. So we're going to have to refer back to occasionally to the other passages we've done uh, just so that we're making sure that we're getting everything right in context because it does keep the same thoughts uh, flowing forward from the beginning. Uh, with that said, let's dig right in here in, in verse number 1. The Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. And just that statement alone is just is so powerful. Behold, what manner of love. Like, it's one thing to say, hey, God loves us. We know God loves us. But look at what manner this is that God loves us, that we should even be called the sons of God. I mean, you don't get a closer relationship than a, a, a father and a son or, you know, like a, a family, that level of, of kinship and closeness of saying that, you're not, you're not just some stranger that God loves. You're not just some foreigner, some outsider. You're the son of God. God's going, you are my son. And he's the one giving us that title, that label of being a child of God. That is special. I mean, we're as creation. We're just human beings. We're just sinful flesh. We just you know, have these short lives. We live a life that, that we, we commit so much sin in general against God, yet God is willing to love us and to love us enough to say, you're my child. Amen. That's amazing. That is incredible. That just shows and exemplifies the love that God has towards us. Therefore, the Bible says, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Now, this whole chapter is, is going to be talking about these ideas that do revolve around us being the children of God, being sons of God, being born of God. And, and we're going to hit some verses that might appear to be very troublesome. They might seem contradictory. They might be hard to understand. But keep in mind, as we, as go, we through go through this, 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 is, this all is all talking, talking about, about essentially, essentially the difference between the spirit and the flesh. The new man, the old man, what it means to be born of God, to be born again. These are the concepts that are going to be drilled into and really expressed clearly uh, about what it's talking about. But in order to even get to this point, we had to start somewhere, which is why we have some of the more basic concepts at the beginning before we get a little bit more advanced in our understanding of what John's even talking about when he's writing this epistle. Um, but too far ahead of myself. Let's keep reading here. The Bible. How are we the sons of God? And even this this one phrase and this one beginning of this this verse here in verse two, it it destroys the idea or the notion that probably most people in this world have that everybody's a child of God. I mean, how many times you go out soul winning, and and it just comes up in conversation where people just assume. Well, we're all God's children, right? We're all children of God. Everybody is. But the Bible very specifically and very clearly teaches that that is not the case. We are all God's creation. We were made in the image of God and God made us. That does not make every human being a son of God. Just as much as the animals aren't sons of God either. Right? Because God, God created them too. But just because we're his creation doesn't make us his son. That's why, you know, John 1.12 says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So there's a time when we weren't a son of God, we weren't a child of God, but then because of our faith, because we trust Jesus as our Savior, then we become a child of God. And this is similar to what the verse is saying here. Hey, now are we the sons of God? Amen. And it's also important to say, hey, now we are not, we're going to be some point in the future either. Yeah. Like you, you are now. If you're, if you're saved, you are a child of God right now. Amen. You don't become one later, but you also weren't one in the past, <laughs> right? <laughs> when you got saved, that's when you became a child of God. So, so lots of false ideas out there just about even just something as simple as being a son of God. No, now we are 
and we shall be forever sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. So you say, now we're the sons of God, we know this, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. And this is in reference, and, and you'll get this as we continue on, because our body hasn't been changed yet. Our body is not fully redeemed. So right now, spiritually, we're the sons of God. Because there's that new spiritual man, that new creature that was born again inside of us. That is why we're saved, why we could be called the sons of God. But there's still a manifestation in the future of our flesh where we get new flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks a lot about that. Where we will see him as he is. With the, where we continue in this verse. Verse 2 says, but we know that when he shall appear, talking about Christ... When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And that's the moment when we get that new body, when our body is transformed. We're in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, as chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians reads, will be changed at the last trump. There's going to be that, that time Christ comes back and then, boom, we're all, our flesh is changed. And that's when we put on, we, we, we've, we lose the likeness of Adam and it's changed into the likeness of Christ. So that this, this carnal, fleshly body you know, passes away, but then we get that new spiritual body. And that's formed and fashioned after Christ. So um, that's what this is referring to here. Verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Now, We'll, we'll get into this a little bit more, but this, this verse is related to a few others. Um, some of the things that people will teach out of 1 John chapter 3, um, a lot of people will turn to this passage and try to teach that like, one, they'll teach sinless perfection in the sense that it's possible for human beings to achieve a state where they are just not sinning at all. And that's false. And that was, that's proven false from John, 1 John chapter 1. But if we say that we have no sin, you know, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Okay? So, so that's clearly, and that's why that groundwork is laid. Because as we get into this, there's going to be some statements made that do have to make sense somehow. But the way that these verses are applied oftentimes is, is very wrong and very incorrect. And some people will start to use this to be like, see, this is how we can know if someone's saved or not, which is also incorrect and a little bit faulty to try to determine whether or not somebody is even saved. Yeah. But, but let's dig into this. Uh, let's continue. So it says, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For Sin is the transgression of the law. And this is a great definition of sin. It just tells us what sin, you know. If people get confused, you talk to someone, they say, like, well, what is sin? You go to the door, maybe you're talking to a younger person, especially, and they're just like, I don't need, never even heard of sin. What is sin? And look, that's out there. It's crazy these days that people don't have that knowledge of what it is. But hey, praise God, you've got a good definition in 1 John chapter 3. Well, what is sin? Sin's a transgression of law. They say, well, what's transgression? <laughs> You're breaking it, right? Like you've broken the law. Now, people could at least understand that these days. You've broken God's law. That's a sin, right? Simple concept, but this is, it's a good definition here. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. Talking about Jesus. And in him is no sin. And this is a great verse to show people that don't know. And look, I literally, literally today led someone to Christ that didn't know that Jesus Christ was sinless. Didn't know it. About the Trinity, didn't know a lot of real basic facts about Christianity. That still, thank God, most people we talk to do have that background in the United States of America. But the younger generation increasingly do not have that background at all. As people in general and families are just not even going to church and kind of drifting away from the things of God. They just are ignorant and just, just more and more people don't have this understanding. So, going back to this morning's sermon, hey, prove to people what the Bible says. Show them, right? That's why I'm super happy. Like, 
I had my Bible with me as I'm giving the gospel to this guy because I wanted him to see in black and white, like, look, Jesus didn't sin. And I took him to, to, to 1 Peter. You know, I didn't, I didn't go here, but this is another verse that you could use. There's plenty of verses that talk about, hey, the fact that Jesus Christ didn't sin. And we have one more right here. In him is no sin. He was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Amen. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. And I'm just going to start getting into this right now. Because these are some pretty strong statements. Say, well, whosoever abideth in him doesn't sin. Okay, and whosoever sins hath not seen him, neither known him. And you say, well, wait a minute. I've sinned, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like, what do you mean? Like, I don't, I, I, I don't know him. I've never known him. I haven't, I haven't seen him. I don't know, you know, like, like, what does this mean? Well, this, this is kind of the beginning of this he and whosoever type of language that we're going to continue to see in, in these next few verses specifically that is going to follow along these same lines. And the way that we make sense of it, the way that this is true and the way we understand this, especially, and look, we, we have to take this as a whole because he already started off the epistle saying that if you say you don't have sin, you're deceiving yourself. So, so he's, he's starting with that fundamental, foundational, simple fact of just saying, look, just so you know, I'm not saying, you know, like if any of you guys are saying you don't have sin, you're lying to yourself. You're kidding yourself. Of course you have sin. So you, you have to start with that groundwork because then as he gets into some of these a little bit more complicated, you know, deep dive into what he's really trying to teach, you, it, it, it's important to have that so you don't misconstrue or misinterpret what he's saying here. So the foundation is, look, you, you've all sinned. There's, there's no one that doesn't sin. And you still sin, and we know that you sin, right? But he's teaching a truth here about being born again, about being a child of God, which is how we started off chapter 3, about so, what's special about being a son of God. And when you are born again, as Jesus explains in John chapter 3, you are a new creature. You, are, you have a new person, a new, a new spirit, ultimately, that's born inside of you. And I'll read for you from John 3, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Amen. John 3, 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So clearly, you have to be born again in order to be saved. Right? You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. It's what he tells Nicodemus. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, first birth, born of water, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, mother's water breaks, you're born of the flesh, first birth. Everyone has a first birth. But not everyone has a second birth. Second birth is born of the Spirit, and that's why he says, and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Second birth, born again, born of the Spirit, spiritual birth, that's what you need in order to see the kingdom of God. Amen. And those that don't have that, you don't have the Spirit, you don't have the new Spirit, not going to see the kingdom of God. Amen. So if you don't have that new Spirit, what do you have? You've got the flesh. And we're going to, don't, trust me, we're going to go to other passages of Scripture and we're going to really see this taught in other places of the Bible than just in 1 John. Okay? This is, this is taught in multiple places that teach the dichotomy between our spirit and our flesh. And also, just so you understand, being born again is not just a New Testament teaching. This isn't something that started happening with believers in the New Testament because later in John chapter 3, he rebukes Nicodemus for not knowing these things. Amen. So how could... It, there, Jesus cannot rebuke someone for not knowing something if, like, no one knew it and there's no way he could have known it because, hey, that's old... Like, I know the Old Testament stuff. I don't know what you're teaching now. No, you should have known this. Art thou a master of Israel and knowest thou not these things? Yeah. So when he said to, to Nicodemus, he's like, how do, you, how do you not know this? This is basic, man. Well, how do you not know it? Because he wasn't saved. Yeah. Nicodemus wasn't born again. 
Now, I think he probably did get saved, but, but the point is, at, that, at this point, he was not, because he didn't understand these things. He was just like, what are you talking about? Can a man go into his mother's womb be born again? Like, like, I don't know what you're talking about. And Jesus is like, how could you not know these things? People were saved by grace all throughout history, Amen. always, Amen. and they were born again all throughout history. Because if you're not born again, you're not seeing the kingdom of God. So that's not, that clearly can't be something new. Amen. Now, when the Bible says, verse 6, I think, in 1 John 3 is where we left off, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. I'm going to say this now. I'll end up proving this later as we go to other passages. It's your flesh that sins. Amen. And it's your flesh that causes you to sin. And that's, it's your flesh that kind of retains all of your sin. That is where our sin is found. Okay, so whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Your flesh is not saved. Your flesh doesn't know Christ. Your flesh is always going to drive you to sin. The spirit is the exact opposite. Amen. That new spirit, that new cre creation that's within you only knows righteousness and good. Okay? So, whosoever abideth in him or lives in him, talk about Jesus, doesn't sin. Because Jesus didn't sin, so if you're in him, you're not, you don't sin. Verse 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Who? Jesus is righteous, right? So he that doeth righteousness is righteous. Now, those that are unsaved don't have the Spirit. And you can say, yeah, I mean, they could still do right things, but they're not doing righteousness. Because if you don't have the Spirit and you don't believe in God, you can't even please God. Right. That's what the Bible says. Amen. So you're not really serving God if you're not saved. You, you can't. Like, you, 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 you end up um, only having your sinful flesh, so you're not going to be able to, to be considered righteous, but you know what? He that doeth righteousness is righteous. And what, do, what is it that does righteousness for the believer? It's Christ in you. Amen. That's where the credit goes. That's where the, you know, from the new man, that's, that's where our righteousness is even found. Amen. It's not in our flesh, but it comes from that spirit that's born of God. Amen. Verse number eight, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. And again, it's like, he that committeth sin is of the devil. Um, <laughs> wait, I've committed sin. <laughs> now, now, here's what you got to watch out for with this verse, too, in this passage, is the people who want to go back to the Greek to explain away what the passage actually says. Yeah. We're reading this Bible in English. Is it that hard to understand someone that commits sin? No, of course not. I mean, we know what it means to commit sin. You sin, that means you commit sin, right? Like you, you, you tell a lie, you commit a transgression, you commit a sin. That's what it means. I mean, that's literally what, what, the, the, what, what it means in English. But what they'll try to do is tell you, well, you know that word commit. In, in Greek, that word means you make a habit of sinning or you continually sin or, you know, and they try to make it out to be something that it's not when it's like, no, you know what? When, when the translators translated that as commit sin, it's right. Amen. And it means what it says. It doesn't mean anything different. It doesn't say, and whosoever continues to commit sin, no. Let the Bible say what it says and then, and then understand it. You know, people get confused. They don't understand what it means. But we can't change what the Bible says. He that committed sin is of the devil. Amen. Is what it says. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. 
So who is he that committeth sin? Who is it? It's going to be our flesh. We all sin. But look at this in verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. So is he that commits sin is of the devil, and he that doesn't, whosoever does not, um, is born of God. Basically, if you're born of God, you don't commit sin. And again, this is why John started off saying, look, we've all sinned. And if you say you haven't sinned, you're deceiving yourself because he's talking about you, like you, collectively. Mm -hmm. Right? Like you as just as a person. As a person, we consist of body, soul, and spirit. Amen. Right? Amen. But now he's, he's digging down into what it means to be a son of God, and there's, there's, ne there's two different parts of us. There's, you know, there's the, the spirit part that's new, and then the flesh part that's old. The the whosoever is born of God, that would be your spirit, your new man that's born again, does not commit sin. And then it tells us why. Why why do you not commit sin? And this is this is clear. This is clear. It would be probably too hard to really comprehend easily. But he says, For his seed remaineth in him. Why is it that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin? Because his seed remaineth in him. What seed? Oh, wait. I think, I've, I think I've read something about this before. Turn, if you would, to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. Amen. And, then, and then that verse continues to say, And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. And also, this says nothing about commit there either, by the way. Because uh, you know, that, that word commit is what the people try to spin and say, So it just means you make a practice of sinning, or you just habitually sin. Or so. No, then why did it say he cannot sin? Yeah. They say he cannot habitually sin, can, co he cannot committing sin, or you know, like whatever. Like that's not what it says. So he cannot sin. Yeah. Amen. You can't sin. So like, let the Bible say say what it says, and then try to understand it. And the Apostle John was not schizophrenic <laughs> of like saying, "Hey, if you say you have sin, you deceive you deceive yourself. The truth's not in you." And by the way, you don't sin. Right? Like, like, for them both to just mean the same thing. There's, there's no way they can both mean the same thing, which is why he's clarifying, hey, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Why? Because his seed remains in him. And that seed is what brings forth the new life of the new man. Amen. As it's referred to in other scriptures as well. Like this, this truth is not confined to John's epistle. It's just elaborated on in John's epistle. It's taught in other epistles. God revealed his word through his, his uh, men of God, through apostles, through his disciples, to give us the word of God and to give us in totality this word and this understanding so that we could understand this concept as a whole. First Peter cha uh, chapter 1, verse 23, the Bible says, Being born again... And again, it's the, same, it's the same thing we're talking about. First John chapter 3, we're talking about being born again. We're talking about being sons of God. First Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. We are born, as I mentioned earlier this morning, you know, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. And that word of God is incorruptible. Amen. And so just as the seed is incorruptible, it brings forth an incorruptible life of the spirit. The spirit is incorruptible. It's born of God. The new man is born of God, which is why we could even be called the sons of God and we are children of God because we're born of that incorruptible spirit and that spirit is also, as we're being taught, incorruptible. Amen. The spirit doesn't sin. Amen. Which is also the only reason why when you shed your flesh, you get to go to heaven because your spirit is sinless. You don't have to worry about that. that you, you don't have to worry about like, hey, well, I'm a sinner, so I'm going to be kept out of heaven. No, your, your, your sinful flesh is down here. Amen. Which is why flesh and blood doesn't inherit the kingdom of God. Because our body stays here. Nobody is just transported, unchanged, in their flesh and blood going to heaven. Even Elijah was carried up into heaven by whirlwind, did not, is not in heaven with his flesh and blood right now. There's no way.
Turn for to Galatians chapter 5. Because Galatians 5 teaches about this as well. The difference between the spirit and the flesh. Because the claim is made in 1 John chapter 3, hey, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And I'm saying that that's the spirit. Amen. Yeah. Because the reason why the whosoever is born of God doesn't commit sin, because the seed remaineth in him. And that seed is talking about being born again. It's talking about being from the word of God. Galatians 5, verse 16. And again, you could read more of this in context later, just you know, to get it more, more fully. But for sake of time, I'm trying, I'm trying to get through as much as I can with these references. Verse 16 says, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we're being taught in Galatians chapter 5, if you walk in the spirit, then you won't sin. Because you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. So by walking in the spirit, hey, you're not committing sin. Now, the problem is that we don't always walk in the spirit, right? Because if you could always walk in the spirit, then you would never sin anymore. But, but because you're, when you're walking in the spirit, though, hey, the spirit doesn't sin. Your flesh causes you to sin. So when you walk in the flesh, you're going to sin. The Bible says in verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that ye would. Would means what you want to do. So your flesh is, is causing you to not do all the things that you want to do. In your inner man, your spirit, I want to do good. I want to walk in the spirit. I want to serve God. I want to win souls to Christ. I want to read the Bible. I want to pray. I want to do all the righteous things. And your flesh is going, I'm tired. Flesh is going, I'm hungry. Your flesh is going, ooh, I want to lust after this. I want to lust after that. I want to do that. You know, let's go here. Let's do that. Let's, let's drink this. Let's do that. You know, whatever. Your flesh is doing all these things to prevent you from doing righteousness, from walking in the spirit, from doing what's right. And it's a constant daily battle. And it's not automatic that you will just automatically walk in the spirit if you're saved. Which is also why you can't look at somebody's works to determine if they're saved. Amen. Because the Bible says there in verse 25, you want to jump down to verse number 25 in Galatians 5, because it talks about the, the, the fruits of the, of the flesh and, the, and the, the lusts of the flesh, and then it talks about walking in the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit and all this stuff, and, and it goes into more detail. But then it says in verse 25, hey, if we live in the Spirit, which we do because we're saved, Amen. let us also walk in the Spirit. So, hey, I live in the Spirit, but you know what? Yeah, you got to walk in the Spirit now. Amen. Do right so then you don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. This wouldn't make sense if it just, nope, automatically happens. I mean, yeah, I'm saved, so I just don't sin anymore. Like, that is silly. But what doesn't sin is the Spirit. But the flesh does. Hey, do you remember when Jesus said, the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak? He was talking to his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. Hey, the flesh wants them to sleep. Their eyes were heavy. They, they were, I mean, they're exhausted. They were tired. But the Spirit is saying, no, we got to be here for Jesus. We got to pray for him. We got to strengthen him. We got, you know, we got to support Christ. We got to be here for him in his time of need. And his flesh is going, no, I'm tired. Get, you know, sleep. Close your eyes. Hey, the Spirit is willing. The Spirit wants to do what's right. Your flesh weakens you and causes you to do the things that you don't really want to do. They all wanted to stay. The, Peter, James, John, they wanted to stay up with him. They wanted to, to be there for him. Amen. No doubt. No doubt. But the flesh caused them to not. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. And Romans 7 is, is, is huge support of what is being taught in 1 John chapter 3. And in fact, teaching this, I would never not go to Romans 7 and, and be able to teach on 1 John chapter 3 because they go so hand in hand together. Like you, you, you Amen. they're so um, complementary to each other and helpful in getting the big picture of this subject to where it makes it a lot easier to understand what John is talking about when, when the statements are made like, hey, whosoever is born of God doesn't commit sin. Because that's just kind of like, whoa. What? <laughs> Any normal person knows, like, yeah, I'm, I'm a sinner, right? 
But see, the people who, don't, who just don't understand this at all and who aren't saved would like to take this and be like, oh, yeah, see, I mean, I'm saved, I don't sin. And it's a very small percentage of people, but they are out there. There's this holiness Pentecostal movement out there that's, that's not very popular, and it's, not very, it's, it's, it's few and far between where I actually run into these people, but I literally have spoken to people who have been like, yeah, you know what, I haven't really sinned in the past five years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, the thought of foolishness is sin. <laughs> That's a pretty foolish thought that you just had there. Now, the only way that could be true is if you got saved five years ago and you're talking about the new man. That's the only way that could be true because that's what 1 John 3 is talking about. Right? Yeah, I haven't sinned because, because my spirit hasn't sinned. But I have sinned because my flesh has sinned. Right? So there's, there's this distinction here between the parts of us that make up who we are, our spirit, our soul, and our body. So I had you turn to Romans 7. Let's start reading in verse number 4. I mean, really the whole chapter covers this subject in depth. Verse number 4 says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh... The motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So verse 5 is talking about, hey, when we were in the flesh, because they're not now. Now, when we're in the flesh, motions of sin, we were made sinners, the law, the strength of the law, our sin, you know, we're transgressing God's law. It brought forth death. Amen. Brings forth fruit unto death. But now we're delivered from the law. We're saved from the, from the penalty of the law, right? Thank God. We commit sin, but you know what? Now we're washed in the blood of Christ. And he says, now we should serve in the newness of spirit. We're not going to serve in the flesh, but newness of spirit. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. And look at verse number nine. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And this, and I'm not going to teach on this too much. I've, I've taught on this in the past, not that long ago. Everybody, when you're, when you're born physically, your first birth has a lively spirit. Your spirit is alive and your soul and your body. Okay. When you get to, we'll call it the, the, you know, the age of accountability, when you, you can understand the difference between right and wrong, and you sin where God is going to hold you responsible for your sin because you should know better, right? Whatever point that is, I'm not going to get deep into that. But at that point, that is when um, sin revives and then you die. Okay, that's when it's like, okay, you sinned, now you died. And this is true going back to Adam and Eve in the garden where God said, hey, in the day that thou eatest of, thou shalt surely die. And they ate and they surely died. But they didn't die physically because the death was a spiritual death. Same way with us, just as Adam and Eve sinned, their spirit died. When we sin, when we commit our own sin, our spirit dies within us, which is why we need to be born again. We need that birth. We need that spiritual birth. Right, which is also why babies, infants, babies in the womb, when someone murders them, when they die, they go straight to heaven because they don't have sin. Amen. They're not sinners, right? Which is why we don't have to worry about baptizing babies because baptism doesn't save anyways. And you don't need to do any hocus pocus on a child to, to make sure they go to heaven. You know, they're already saved. Amen. It's... When that commandment came and sin revived, that's when you die. And that's what he's explaining here. Now, let's continue on. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Now, look, the commandments of God are good, right? 
And if you keep all the commandments, you've got life. But it's death to us because we, we fall short and we fail and we break, we break the commandments. So the law isn't bad, like he said. It's not that the law is bad. I'm bad. I made bad choices. I, I broke the law. So the law is still good, even though it brought death unto me. The law is still good. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me. Yeah, we all got been deceived by sin, right? Thinking it's going to be something, you know, Adam and Eve were deceived. Thinking it's going to be something different than it actually was. And by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. The law is good. The law wasn't made death unto you, but sin is death. God forbid, it wasn't, it's not the law's fault, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now we're going to really get into the difference between the carnal Carnal means fleshly. So the be here's a good way to understand this. If you go to a Mexican restaurant and you get carne asada, you get some carne, right? That's meat. It's flesh. You're getting flesh. Like, I, mean, I don't want the veggie burger. Okay, I don't want the, the bean and cheese burrito. All my kids want the bean and cheese burrito. I want the carne, man. Give me the carne, right? Because meat, it's flesh. Amen. So... The word carnal, right? It's, it's, this, it's of the body. It's fleshly, okay? We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And this is the Apostle Paul writing the Epistle of the Romans, okay? And he's saying he's carnal. And then he explains that, verse 15, for that which I do, so what I'm actually doing, I allow not. I say, what do you mean you don't allow that? Well, because... Internally, he knows that sinning and doing things are bad or wrong, and he doesn't want to do them. Yet, he still does. I mean, is there anyone here that just says, like, nope, I have all these rules according to the Bible that I know are sins, and I never do them. I don't allow them, and I never do them. No? No one's that bold today to raise their hand and say... <laughs> No, that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, again, meaning what I want, that do I not. But, that, but what I hate, that do I. This can only happen in the life of a saved person where you have this dichotomy of someone who's going, like, look, I hate this. And why do we hate it? Because it's against the God. It's against the things of God. It's against the Spirit. But I still do it. Why? Because your flesh, your flesh wants bad. Your flesh wants sin and your spirit wants good. And it's this battle. Verse 16 says, If then I do that which I would not, if I do the things I don't want to do, I consent unto the law that it is good. Hey, the law is good. Just because I do things that are against God's law and I break God's law doesn't mean the law is bad. The law is good. But then he says this, look at verse 17. Now then, it is no more I that do it. It's not me. I don't want to do these things, but I end up doing the things I don't want to do. I want to serve God, but you know what now? It's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. This is teaching the same exact thing that the Apostle John is teaching in 1 John chapter 3. Amen. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. That's who you, that's you, right? We identify as, I identify as a Christian, right? Man, I'm so sick of that. I, I, I hate that language now because of how much it's abused and how many people are identifying as all these crazy things. But our identity is in the new man. It's in that which is born of God. That's who we are. So when you say it's not me, it's just a sin that dwelleth in me, it's not just a cop-out, right? The Bible well, clearly is already saying, look, I know the law is good. I know that, you know, like I'm the one that's in. But he's, but he's saying me, like who I, who I really am, that's not who's sinning. It's this flesh, which is why when the flesh dies, hey, then we don't have to worry about that anymore. That's good. That's gone. Amen. 
praise the Lord. And then God's going to give us a new flesh that doesn't sin. And that isn't going to be constantly in battle with our spirit. But it, it's, it's our identity, who we are, is that new man. And that's why you can say, hey, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Why? Because it's holy, because a seed remains in because that's born of God. Amen. Let's keep reading here, verse number 18. For I know that in me, and again, this parenthetical statement, he's clarifying that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing for to will is present with me but how to perform that which is good I find not I do have a will right I have a choice I, I want to do things but I'm still having this hard time doing what's right why because in me in my flesh there's no good thing there there's no good and that's why hey whosoever committed sin is of the devil that's your flesh there's no good thing. Verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. He's like, man, I want to do good and I'm not doing good and I don't want to do evil and I'm doing evil. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. See how these go hand in hand? It's, it's not me, right? And again, don't use this as a cop-out to be like, no, no, I'm perfect. Yeah, it's, just not, it's not me. It's just a sin. You know, like, but, it, but it's a truth. It, it is absolutely a truth, 100%. That spirit is not going to sin. And that's why when we walk into sin, hey, you're, you're walking, walking into sin. When you're walking into spirit, you're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh because the, the spirit's guiding, you're leading, you're walking the spirit, and it's not, and, and you, you don't ever get a mixture of the two. It's, it's one or the other. We're walking in the spirit, we're walking in the flesh. We always have the flesh with us when we're walking in the spirit, but when you're walking in the spirit, I mean, you're not sinning, you're, you're doing right. You're doing righteousness, you're of God. But when you're walking in the flesh, you're not, you're not doing good either. I mean, you're, not, you're never in this mixture state of like, I'm in the flesh and spirit, other than the fact that you exist as a tripartite human being, three parts, body, soul, spirit. Verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I love God's law in the spirit, in the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And you know, if you're born again today, you should understand this Amen. wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. I know I do. I get so disgusted and fed up with myself when, I, when you do something that's wrong, when you commit sin, you're just like, man, I don't want to do this. Like, I really don't want to do that. I don't want to commit this sin. I don't want to be in that situation. I just can't wait for the day where I just don't even have to worry about that anymore. Amen. But here we are, right? We're in this condition. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And notice just even in this wording, I myself serve the law of God, identifying with the spirit. Amen. But hey, my flesh, is, it's, the, it's this law of sin. Amen. And we need to be spiritually minded so that like who you are and, and how you're identifying is not with your flesh. Amen. And you know, people of the world, how do they identify with of the flesh? When you meet people, think about when you're younger and you're making friends, you're talking to people about what? All the things that you like. It's going to be all the things of the flesh that you like. And you kind of gravitate towards other people that this is who I am. This is the movies and the music and the, you know, all these things in my flesh that I like. That's who I am. And that's who you identify as. You identify because you don't even have a spirit. If you're not saved, that's just it. But if you are saved, you can still identify with those things. But what I'm saying is don't. You should be identifying with the new man, with the spirit. Not with the flesh, not with the lust of the flesh, not with the things of this world. You should be identifying with the things of God spiritually, the new man. Hey, I love serving God. Amen. 
I love church. Amen. I love singing the hymns. I love serving God. This is, this is who I am. This is what I really like doing. I like walking in the Spirit. I like the fruit of the Spirit. I don't like the fruit of the flesh. This is who I am. And this is a great truth. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 3. So hopefully with the added scripture there of, of you know, Romans chapter 7 being considered with 1 John chapter 3, with John 3 where Jesus is talking about being born again, with 1 Peter chapter 1 talking about the incorruptible seed, you know, and, we, and we, we compare scripture with scripture, hopefully it's really clear now. Now when we go back and read like, oh yeah, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for a seed remaineth in him, that it shouldn't be troubling, it shouldn't be something that bothers you, he cannot sin because he's born of God. The, the, the worst thing you could do is be like, oh man, I sinned, maybe I'm not saved. And, and people who are unsaved have that fear and have that doubt going like, oh man, how can I say I'm saved because I sinned? They're not understanding. No, 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 no. When you don't sin, it's your spirit that's saved that doesn't sin. Of course your flesh still sins. Which is why we go back to John 1. Look, if you say you haven't sinned, you're deceiving yourself. You're lying. All right, 1 John chapter 3, verse number 10. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Now, there's a lot of negatives in this. So just like not and not and isn't and, you know. So for the next few years, we're going to see that a lot. Now, the children of God... Those that are born of God, right? They're sons of God. You put your faith in Jesus Christ and you have the new man. But then who are the children of the devil? Those are the reprobates. Amen. Right? That, that they have no salvation. There is no spirit. They're twice dead. Now, this is also similar to how you can identify the false prophet when it talks about his fruit, right? Because his fruit is dead. And a, a corrupt tree can't bring forth good fruit. And a reprobate is, cannot do righteousness. So the children of the devil says, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Now what some people want to do is be like, see, look, I never see this person ever doing righteous, so they must not be saved. But the doing righteousness, first of all, you can't always see what people are always doing. I mean, you can't, right? And you definitely can't know whether or not someone has the internal struggle of the spirit and the flesh because it's an internal thing, which is why we don't just look to the outward appearance of people doing good or doing bad to determine if they're saved. Because if you're saved, you've got that spirit, you're born again, and you will have that dichotomy. Now, if you are someone that just says, like, I never have any internal struggle, and I never have any, you know, I don't feel like there's any battle going on, then you're not saved. Yeah. Amen. That's right. Amen. And you should check your salvation, because if you don't, that's an internal thing. You, you're the only one that will know that. But if you're just like, no, I'm always cool, just doing whatever, and there's just never any, never any conflict, it's no, no, no problem, man, you, 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 need to, <laughs> you need to get saved. Amen. Okay, because, you know, that, that new creature is there. Amen. And where, where some people will take this too far into saying, like, oh, I believe in a gospel that changes. Well, so do I. Mm -hmm. Because there absolutely is a change. There's a new creature. There's a new man that's born again and born inside of you. A hundred percent. No question about that. Yes, there's a gospel that changes. Praise the Lord. It's a gospel that changes. It just doesn't always outwardly manifest itself in every single convert. Or even then, it might not manifest itself outwardly for a long time either. Right? Like, but, but you can't watch someone 24 hours a day and you also can't get a glimpse inside of their person to know what's going on internally. 
I mean, I'll tell you this much. When I was in the world and, and, and I was saved and I was living a wicked lifestyle and I was doing things I shouldn't have been doing, you better believe there was a lot of, of uh, the spirit going, what are you doing? And a lot of guilt and a lot of shame and a lot of, you know, like that internal struggle was real. And there was a lot of, I mean, really being like the Apostle Paul being like, man, this flesh is just, and, and I didn't even know it at the time, you know, like I kind of knew it, but like it was just this, oh man, it's terrible. Like I don't really want to do these things at all. Why? Because I was saved. Because before he's saved, it's like, who cares? That's yeah, not a big deal. But then it's like, no, man, I, I don't, I don't want to do this works of darkness and stuff, but like, I don't want anything to do with that. Let's, let's keep reading here. We're at 1 John chapter 3, verse number 10. In this, the children of God are manifest, the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Doeth not righteousness. The, the children of the devil can't do righteousness. Neither he that loveth not his brother. And the Bible says that, you know, that if you're born again, you know, like you, you shouldn't hate your brother. But like furthermore, hey, if you don't love your brother, you know, how dwell the love of God in you? Amen. And here it's saying, you know, that's how the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Neither he that uh, loveth not his brother. Verse number 11, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Verse 12, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, saying, Cain is a child of the devil, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew him? Because his own works are evil, and his brother is righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Now, verse 12, it's using an example from the Old Testament to illustrate a greater truth, right? Which is, again, continuing with that battle between the spirit and the flesh where Cain is representative of the flesh, which is of the devil, which is causing you to sin, and Abel is of the spirit and of God, and is accepted of God, and showing how there's always this battle. And Cain killed Abel. Why? Because he wasn't righteous, and his brothers was, and that just makes him angry. And the children of the devil rage against God against the things of God. And you know what oftentimes triggers people and sets them off is when they see people doing righteousness. Amen. It just bothers them that much more and can infuriate them just by seeing someone doing righteousness. It's crazy, right? But that's, I mean, we saw that in Jesus' day. The, the, the false prophets, the Pharisees, they were losing their lids. I mean, they were just losing their mind. When, what, by what? Jesus healing people. Like he's doing righteousness. He's doing right. And they want to kill him. They want to destroy him. And they couldn't stand him. And they got rabid in their anger towards him. Why? They didn't have the spirit. They embodied the flesh. They were children of the devil. Amen. And Jesus is just doing righteousness. And that's why he says here then in verse 13, hey, marvel not. Don't be surprised if the world hate you. You sons of God, you children of God, don't, don't, don't let that be a big shocker when the world's going to hate you. You can turn there if you like, John 15. I'm going to read real quickly from John chapter 15. Verse number 18. The Bible reads, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. This is Jesus saying, hey, don't be surprised the world hates you because they... The world hated me long before it hated you. So don't, don't feel bad. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. Say, the world's not going to hate you when you're of the world. The world loves his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. And this is, you know, man, I wish more of the lamestream Christianity would read this passage Amen. Mm -hmm. that wants to tell you, you know, tell us fundamental Baptists like, oh, you guys are doing it wrong. And why do you got people hating on you? Like, we, we don't have anyone hating us. You know, you could talk to people, you know, you could say things different. You could do this or do that or do you know, live your life different so that no one hates you. Like, yeah, well, 
Jesus said that we're not better than him. Because I would just say, how closely are you following Jesus? Because if they hated Jesus, why aren't they hating you? Mm -hmm. Why does the world just love you so much? The world doesn't love us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Who hates you? Nobody. <laughs> okay. Well, Jesus wouldn't be like that. Jesus said the world hates him and they persecuted him and they nailed him to a cross. That's how much they hated him. Don't marvel, my brethren, if the world hate you. Verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And that, and that further, further illustrates... Um, that concept, love like, you know, hating your brethren, you know, you ought to love your brethren um, outwardly, but, but inwardly, that's, that's, you know, a test. This is assurance of salvation, which we know we've passed from death into life. And, it, and this is very similar word, worded to John 5, 24, right? Amen. That, um, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And uh, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. Amen. So we know that if you believed on him, we pass from death unto life. But here's a little assurance of your salvation. We know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. Amen. See how those two go hand in hand? And, you know, just a, a little side note, too, and, and many of you, I'm sure, have experienced this. When you go out soul winning and you run into someone you've never known before, but then they give you the testimony of salvation, isn't it funny how there's just this kinship that's just there already and there's this love between, like, both of you when you run into someone who's actually saved? And then you run into these other people that, that want to talk about how loving they are, but then they're really nasty to you when you just bring up like the gospel or just ask them if they're saved or something. They're all like proud, like, oh, what do you mean? I'm not saved. You know, like, I'm just asking you. And they'll be the ones that talk about how loving they are and how we're doing it wrong because we've got people hating on us, right? But no, when you, there's a kinship in, in the spirit and a love that ought to be there if you're saved. A love for the brethren. The Bible says, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Verse 15, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Now, again, another passage, very similar. I'm not going to go into this too in depth because this is like 1 Corinthians 6. This is what we see in Galatians. This is what we see in other passages that give off these lists of sins. Right? It's not a contradiction. It's not saying, well, murder is just this extra supreme sin that will just make you lose your salvation or call you know, like if you murdered someone you can't be saved that's not what this is saying okay what this is saying is very similar to what we see in revelation 21 8 Amen. right now now see people like to turn to just this one passage like first john three fifteen. hey no murder at the eternal life see you can't be a murderer and be saved well what about moses yeah. i'm pretty sure he murdered somebody what about david the Bible says that he was responsible for the murder of Uriah the Hittite. Amen. Uriah the Hittite. He, like that, he was the one responsible. Even though he wasn't physically the one that did it. He's the murderer. But they're both saved. So, so clearly, that's not, it, 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 it has a deeper meaning, a, you know, a, an understanding that you need to have about this which is similar to Revelation 21, 8, it says fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. Hey, but it's like, yeah, but I've lied. Mm -hmm. I've sinned. I've done these things. So does that mean I'm not saved? No, because you're washed, because you're sanctified, because you're justified by the blood of Christ. Amen. So those sins have been forgiven just as much as a murderer, so he says, no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Well, hey, if you're saved, if you're that new man, the new man doesn't sin, you're not a murderer. Amen. Verse number 16. 
1 John 3, 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Again, showing, first of all, it's not automatic, because we ought to. This is something that we should do, but not everyone does that. But this is the amount of love that we should have for the brethren, is self-sacrificial, just like Christ sacrificed himself for us. So I should you should love your brother and sister in Christ enough to lose your life for them. Amen. That's the amount of love that we should have for each other. Amen. And you know what? Remember that when someone does you wrong, by the way. A brother or sister in Christ does you wrong. Remember that, that you ought to still love them enough to, you know, obviously we could have our disputes and we could have our arguments and we could have our problems and people could kind of rub you the wrong way, but don't ever let that get to the point where you're going to forget like, hey, you know what? I'm still going to lay down my life for that person because I love them. And I mean that, like that, that's, you ought to have that love in your heart for your brethren. Even the ones you don't get along with, <laughs> right? Yeah. Verse 17, but whoso hath this world's good. Now he's going to give us an example of having the, the right love. Whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother hath need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? He's calling people out saying, look, I mean, if, you, if God's blessed you with things of this world, you've got the finance, you know, you're, you're in good shape and you've got a brother who's in need. And look, that also is important. They have a need, a need. We need, we need a lot more education on needs versus wants. <laughs> they have a need. <laughs> This isn't saying that like, hey, I need a new cell phone. <laughs> sorry. sorry. That is not a need. But mine broke, man. You got some money. Buy me a cell phone, man. No. It's not what it's talking about. We're talking about legitimate needs. Hey, look, people are going like, I don't know, man. I need my cell phone. <laughs> like, no. no, you don't. You need food. Amen. Mm -hmm. you, you need clothing. Like, <laughs> those are things you need. Okay, yeah. and, and you, you need somewhere where you're not going to like freeze to death out in the elements or something. Amen. Okay. So, and, and obviously, you know, we, we look to this, but we should still look at this and be like, okay, look, someone's really in need and you can help them out, you ought to help them out. Otherwise, how could you say that the love of God dwells in you? You're like, oh yeah, I got, you know, I'm full of love of God. And you're just like walking on the other side of the street, like the, the parable of the, the Good Samaritan. My little children, love, let us not love in word. Right? Like, oh man, I love you, brother. I'll do anything for you. Let's not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. That's how you really prove your love anyways. It's not just saying things, saying nice things. Anyone can say nice things. People do it all the time. Amen. Tell you, oh, I love you, brother. How much I love you. I love you. I love you. And I'm not saying don't say it, but, uh, but, but here's the thing. Don't say it and then not do. <laughs> right? You can tell someone you love them and then you're just going to be like, no. <laughs> Man, just don't say it at all then. Because yeah. now you're just making yourself a liar. Because what, what really matters isn't the words, it's the action, it's the deed, it's, what, it's how you're going to follow up with that. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, Again, there's a lot going on here, and I know I've been preaching for a while, but what, what a great passage for one of the things you can do and one of the ways in which we know that, that God is going to hear our prayers and give us the things that we ask for. Amen. So in these few verses, what does it mean if your heart condemns us? You're feeling guilty. You're, you, you've done wrong. You know that you're, 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 you're doing wrong and you don't have that clear conscience before God, your heart's condemning you. Amen. Right? Amen. But if you're living righteously, you're doing righteousness, 
your heart's not going to be condemning you before God because you're keeping his commandments. He says, look, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Amen. So when you're, when you're living righteously, you've got confidence towards God. And, and look, we all, we all fall short. We know that. But when you are living, I mean, generally speaking, you're still just, you're, you're living righteously. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yes, we all have the, 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 the moments where we sin. I mean, we think something wrong. We do, you know, like, like, but you can still be like, look, man, I, I'm, I am serving God here. I am, I am making sacrifices. I am serving the Lord. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You're going to have that clear conscience with God. Amen. You're not going to just feel like, oh, man, you know, like, like really torn over what you've done when you're doing righteousness. And you know what? When that's the case, he's saying, you know, what? whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. And why? Because we keep his commandments. Because when you're keeping his commandments, then you don't have any reason to be, you know, having, having this condemning in our heart. Amen. And there's going to be times where we're doing better at this than others. But this is what we strive to do. Amen. And one more benefit is to say, hey, well, God's going to hear us then. Do right. Stop walking in the flesh, man. Walk in the spirit. Walk in that new man. Verse 23, and this is his commandment that we should believe on him, excuse me, believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So, those of us who are saved, we all got the first part of that right. Hey, we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen, right? You're saved. You got that part. So you're saved. But then he says, and love one another. Amen. So, because he's saying, remember in, in verse 22, and whatsoever we ask, we receive him because we keep his commandments. And then verse 23, he says, and this is the commandment. One, that you're saved. And two, that you love one another. And loving one another isn't just with your words. It's in deed and in truth. Amen. So God sees you loving in deed, loving in truth, supporting other people, being there for them, making sacrifices for them. And you know what he says? I like that. I'll give you what you want. Amen. You ask me, you're going to receive. Because I like what you're doing. I like seeing you loving your brethren Amen. and being a minister and serving just like Jesus Christ was doing. Verse 24, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. You know, the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. We have the Holy Spirit that's going to also give us the assurance of knowing, hey, I know I'm a son of God because I, the Holy Spirit is also bearing witness with me that, that we are the children of God. Anyways, I, I hope that, that if you had any questions on this passage, if you didn't quite know exactly what it was talking about, what it means, that that is uh, a little bit more clear now, comparing it with Romans 7 especially. And um, if you're still confused, you know, please just talk to me. I'd be happy to try to, to explain it a different way or, or, or maybe show you something that's going to be uh, a better way of understanding it because, you know, some of these passages can be very difficult. And I understand that. So... Um, if you're still not grasping some of the things, or maybe I didn't cover something in depth as, as you might have wanted to see, just talk to me after service. I'd be happy to help you if I can. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, uh, thank you so much for this great wisdom that you give us, Lord, and helping us to understand. It really is a comfort to know um, that when we, when we do sin and when we do screw up and when we are um, convicted in our hearts and, and we're condemning ourselves in our hearts, that, um, that we still know that we have an advocate with the Father. We know that Jesus Christ died for our sins. We know that we have this flesh, this understanding of, of the differences between our spirit and our flesh, Lord, really helps us a lot to be able to reconcile why we do the things that we do. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be strengthened in our spirit, that we could continually, in, increasingly walk more in the spirit and less in our flesh, that we could weaken and mortify our flesh and die to self daily, dear Lord, that we can do right and walk in the spirit because we want to be pleasing to you. We want to serve you, Lord. That is who we are. We are your children and we want to serve you, Lord. Please help us in this endeavor. Open up our understanding and strengthen us in the spirit, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.